What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. Continuing on with our ATIT's version seven science series. And today we'll be looking at life and physical science. Let's get started. So as always, we're gonna start out with our objectives. So for the life and physical science portion of the exam, the test outline is nine items out of the total 44 questions. And those nine items are going to cover cell structure and function, as well as organization, relationship between genetic material and structure of proteins, concepts underlying Mendel's law of inheritance, structure and function of basic macromolecules in the biological system, and role of microorganisms in disease. So let's begin by looking at the biological hierarchy of the body. When we discuss biological hierarchy, we're discussing the ways that we organize structure and living things by classifying those structures by their basic components and more complex components. So these structures are broken down into the following categories. We have chemicals, cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and organisms. So let's take a closer look at each one of these. Chemicals help build cells. So macromolecules are chemicals that are essential to life and are important in carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, as well as nucleic acids. Cells are the basic unit of life. All living things are made up of cells. Cells perform functions that are necessary for life, and there are more than 250 different types of cells that are found within the human body that carry out these processes. Next, we have tissues. Tissues are made up of cells that have similar structure as well as function. There are four types of tissues that are found within the human body. Epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. Tissues can help carry out functions such as protection, support, movement, as well as communication. Organs are made up of tissues that work together to carry out specific functions. So for example, the heart pumps blood throughout the body. Organ systems are a group of organs that work together to carry out specific functions. The human body has a total of 11 organ systems. That includes your integumentary, skeletal, muscular, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, urinary, and reproductive. If you haven't done so already, make sure you watch my human anatomy and physiology video when it comes to the ATITs. There's a lot of good stuff over there. Each organ system has a specific function that helps the body carry out life processes. So for example, the integumentary system helps protect the body from infection as well as disease. And then lastly, we have organisms. They're made up of one or more organ systems. So humans are multicellular organisms that are made up of 11 organ systems as we previously discussed. So let's take a closer look at cell structure and function. Cells are the basic unit of life like we discussed before, and all living things are made up of cells. Cells perform a variety of different functions that are necessary for life, and there are more than 250 different types of cells that help the body do this. The cell is composed of 10 parts. We have the cell membrane, the cytoplasm, the Golgi apparatus, the lysosomes, mitochondrion, nucleus, ribosomes, rough endoplasmic reticulum, smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and there are vacuole. Let's break each one of these down. So we start with the cell membrane, and that is that thin layer of protein and fat that surrounds the cell. The cell membrane has selective permeability, meaning that it allows some substances to enter and exit the cell while keeping other substances out. Then we have the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm is a jelly-like substance that contains the cell's organelles, and it helps support and suspend the structures inside the cell membrane. It also transfers material required for cellular processes. The Golgi apparatus is an organelle that helps with the packaging and transporting of molecules within the cell. It also helps process proteins as well as lipid molecules. Lysosomes are organelles that contain enzymes that break down food and other molecules. They aid in digestion and recycle old cell materials. Lastly, they destroy any invading bacteria as well as viruses. The mitochondria is an organelle that produces energy for the cell. 
They convert nutrients into ATP, which is the cell's energy source. The nucleus is an organelle that contains the cell's hereditary information, also known as DNA. DNA is responsible for the cell's growth, reproduction, and function. Ribosomes are organelles that help synthesize proteins. Proteins are essential for the cells to carry out its functions. These organelles can be found on either the rough endoplasmic reticulum or just floating around within the cytoplasm. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is an organelle that helps with the packaging and transporting of molecules within the cell, and it's also involved in the synthesis of proteins. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the organelle that helps with the packaging and transporting of molecules, specifically lipids, within the cell, and it does not contain any ribosomes. It's also involved in carbohydrate metabolism and it activates toxins along with harmful metabolic products. And then lastly, our vacuole. Our vacuole is the organelle that stores food, water, and other materials. It also helps maintain the shape of the cell. So let's talk about one of my favorite topics of life science, and that is mitosis. Mitosis is the process of cell division that results in two genetically identical daughter cells. The cell cycle is the sequence of events that the cell goes through in order to grow and divide. This cell cycle has five main stages, and that is interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So let's break these down. In interphase, this is the very first stage of the cell cycle. It's when the cell grows and carries out its normal functions. DNA in this phase starts to replicate. In prophase, the second stage is when chromosomes condense and become invisible. The nuclear envelope also starts to break down. In metaphase, the third stage, the chromosomes then line up in the middle of the cell as they start to divide. Anaphase is the fourth stage, and in this stage, the chromosomes are pulled apart in opposite directions. This is when cell division really truly starts to begin. And then lastly, telophase, our final stage. In this stage, that new nuclear envelope forms around the chromosomes that have been split apart. The chromosomes uncoil and become less visible, and the cells then divide into two daughter cells. The cell cycle really is a continuous process that takes place in all cells. Mitosis is just really one part of that cell cycle. After telophase, the two daughter cells can enter into interphase all over again, in which that cell cycle starts at the beginning and continues to divide and divide and divide. So another part of the cell cycle is meiosis. Cells can divide through the process of meiosis, and this particular cell division results in four genetically diverse daughter cells. So unlike in mitosis, meiosis has two stages. Meiosis one, where it's exactly the same, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. And then there's meiosis two, which again, that whole process reduplicates itself. So let's take a closer look. So as we know, interphase is the first stage of meiosis. The cell grows and carries out normal functions and DNA starts to replicate. With meiosis one, prophase one is the second stage of meiosis. And in this stage, homologous uh, chromosomes pair and start to cross over. In metaphase one, this is the third stage. In this stage, those particular chromosomes line up in the middle of the cells that they are paired with. Anaphase one, the fourth stage. In this stage, one chromosome of each pair is then pulled apart in different uh, directions with the cells. And then lastly, in this first phase, telophase one, that fifth final stage, those two daughter cells start to form. Each cell has about half the number of chromosomes as the original cell, and the cell also has a mixture now of genetic information. Once this occurs, those two cells that were processed then again begin to, um, begin to divide. They begin their cell division. So with meiosis two, prophase two, this is that sixth stage, the daughter cells again contain half of the chromosomes of the original cells, right? In metaphase two, in the seventh stage of meiosis, the chromosomes then begin to line up in the middle of the cell again. 
And anaphase two, that eighth stage, the sister chromatids are then pulled apart to opposite sides of the cell. And then lastly, in our final and ninth stage, this is when the cells divide into those four genetically diverse daughter cells, also known as haploids. Meiosis is a continuous process that takes place in all cells. Meiosis one and meiosis two are just two parts of the meiosis cell division cycle. So let's move on to describing the relationship between genetic material and the structure of proteins. And we'll begin by taking a closer look at chromosomes. Chromosomes are a long thread-like structure that is found in the nucleus of cells. They are made up of DNA and histone proteins. The winding structure condenses DNA and allows regulation. All species of living things have chromosomes. Prokaryote organisms like bacteria have one chromosome, whereas eukaryote organisms have multiple chromosomes. So for example, humans have 46 chromosomes in every cell of their body, except for gametes as well as sex cells. Whereas dogs have a total of 78 chromosomes. Isn't that fascinating? Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. One pair is inherited from the mother and the other pair is inherited from the father. This makes up the diploid number of 46. Next, we have those things called genes. Genes are the basic units of heredity. They are made up of DNA and are responsible for the characteristics of an organism. Genes are passed down from parent to offspring. Each gene has instructions on how to make a specific protein. Proteins are large molecules that perform many functions throughout the body. And it's estimated that there are a total of 25,000 genes in the human body. There are two types of genes. We have structural genes and regulatory genes. Structural genes are responsible for the physical traits of an organism. So for example, the color of your eyes and your hair are determined by structural genes. Regulatory genes control the activities of other genes. So for example, regulatory genes can turn other genes on and off. Now let's take a closer look at deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA. DNA is the genetic material that contains genes that are coded with instructions to produce proteins in the cell. DNA is made up of two long chains of nucleotides that twist and create that double helix that you're seeing on the screen. The sequence of the nucleotides in DNA determines the order of amino acids in that protein. This is known as genetic code. These nucleotides have four bases, A for adenine, T for thymine, G for guanine, and C for cysteine. So when we're taking a closer look at base pairs, we're looking at two nucleotides that are bonded together. So for example, A bonds with T and C bonds with G. So a good way that I remember this is ATV and CGI. That's kind of how I help remember which ones bond with which. These complementary bases are linked by hydrogen bonds that pair up to hold the two strands of DNA together. The double helix structure of DNA is very important because it allows for replication. Replication is the process of making two identical copies of DNA. A codon is a sequence of three nucleotides that code for a very specific amino acid. There are 64 possible codons in the DNA code. 61 of these codons code for amino acids, and the other three are actually stop signal codons that end the gene. A mutation may occur during replication that causes a permanent change in that DNA sequence. This can result in a change of the amino acid sequence of the protein and may lead to changes in the structure and function of that protein that's made. Now let's take a closer look at ribonucleic acid, also known as RNA. RNA's principal role is to translate the genetic code of DNA into proteins. RNA is very similar to DNA, except for a few key differences. The most notable difference is the fact that RNA is a single strand. And RNA also uses the base U for uracil instead of T and thymine. So something really cool that DNA and RNA does is transcription and translation. So when it comes to transcription, this is the process of making RNA from DNA. 
the DNA double helix unwinds and one strand of the DNA serves as a template for RNA synthesis. RNA polymerase is an enzyme that catalyzes the formation of RNA from nucleotides. This enzyme attaches to one end of the DNA template and then moves along that template, adding nucleotides one at a time. As RNA is being made, it is complementary to the template strand of DNA. When RNA synthesis is complete, the RNA molecule is released from the DNA template and the DNA double helix formation reforms. RNA is found in three main forms. We have messenger RNA, also known as mRNA, transfer RNA, known as tRNA, and ribosomal RNA, which is rRNA. So with messenger RNA, this is the RNA that carries the genetic code from the DNA in the nucleus to the ribosomes that are found within the cytoplasm. Transfer RNA is the RNA that helps to assemble amino acids into proteins that act as adapters in the translation of genetic sequence. And then lastly, ribosomal RNA, also known as rRNA, is the RNA that makes up our ribosomes. So once we have that transcription piece down, then we move on to translation, and that is the process of making proteins from that RNA. This occurs in the ribosomes found within the cytoplasm. mRNA attaches to a small subunit of a ribosome, and then tRNA brings amino acids to that particular ribosome. As the amino acids are brought to the ribosome, they start to join together by peptide bonds to form a protein. The genetic code is read in groups of three nucleotides, called codons. Each codon code has a very specific amino acid code. The sequence of codons in mRNA determines the sequence of amino acids that are going to be found within the protein that it makes. So let me start by talking about my personal favorite, but it's usually not one of yours, and that is Mendel's Law of Inheritance. Inheritance is the process in which traits are passed from parents to their offspring. We have dominant traits and recessive traits. Mendel's Law of Inheritance states that there are two alleles for each trait. Alleles are alternative forms of genes. One allele, like I said, is dominant, while the other one is recessive. The allele that is expressed is the phenotype of the dominant allele. So let's talk about the inheritance of gene pairs. Each pair contributes one allele to their offspring. So for example, if the mother has the allele for blue eyes, that's lowercase b, and the father has the allele for brown eyes, that's an uppercase b, then the offspring will have the allele for blue eyes and the allele for brown eyes. The allele for blue eyes is considered recessive whereas the allele for brown eyes is dominant. So in this particular offspring, their phenotype will most likely have brown eyes because of that dominant allele, that upper B for brown eyes. However, if both parents have alleles for blue eyes, then their offspring has the chance of having blue eyes as their phenotype. The combination of two alleles is called a genotype. If the chromosome contains two different alleles for a trait, then the genotype is considered heterozygous. If the chromosome contains two identical alleles for a trait, then that genotype is considered homozygous. In the example that we had previously discussed, the mother's genotype was heterozygous, an uppercase B and a lowercase B. And let's say that the father's genotype is heterozygous as well, uppercase B and lowercase B there is a 25% chance that their particular offspring will have the homozygous genotype, and that is lowercase b, lowercase b, meaning that these two brown-eyed parents, if they both had brown eyes, might have an offspring with blue eyes. So again, the question is asking what percentage of offspring are going to have blue eyes? So with our mother, right, we have little b, little b. With our father, we have big b, little b and we're just going to times these. So we have little b times big B. Of course, we're gonna have a big B and a little b. And then again, little b, big B, we're gonna have a big B, a little b. And then here we have b, b, little b, little b, right? Big little b, little b. And then we have little b, little b. So that'll also give us little b, little b. So while the mother does have 
only the recessive uh, genes, the little b, little b, there is still only a 50% chance that this particular offspring is going to have blue eyes. Because as we know, these dominant genes that we have up here, these dominant alleles that the parents have, most likely this offspring is going to have a 50% chance of having brown eyes, or they're going to have a 50% chance of having blue eyes. So we're going to talk about something that's a little complicated, but with a little practice, you're going to get it. So just hang tight. We have inheritance of multiple alleles or dihybrid cross, meaning that there's going to be a nine to three to three to one ratio of a phenotype that is going to be found within the offspring. So as we look over here on the left hand side of our chart, we have a mother flower and a father flower, and they both have the exact same traits, big T, little t, big R, little r. And above my head, I have a key up here to help you break down specifically what we're looking at. So we're looking at height and we're looking at color. So as we know, any kind of dominant gene is going to take over if there is any recessive gene found, right? So big T, big T, obviously they're going to be tall. Big T, little t, again, that is a dominant gene. So they are going to be tall. Even though they have the recessive little t, they have that big T, so they're most likely going to show a tall trait. And then lastly, we have little t, little t. That means they're going to be short. So there's no dominant gene that's taking over any of those little t's to make it tall. Same thing with our color. We have red and we have yellow. With red, we have a big R, big R, obviously going to be red. Big R, little r, remember that dominant gene is there, that dominant trait, so it is going to be red, even though it has the recessive little r. And then little r, little r, again, is going to be yellow because there's no dominant trait taking over. So you might be asking yourself, okay, great, so I have my two traits. How the heck am I supposed to figure out what to put in my square? <laughs> I'm going to help you with that. So what we do is we use the FOIL method. The FOIL method is first, outside, inside, last. So we begin by multiplying our first. So we're looking at two different traits, right? We're looking at height and we're looking at color. So that's how we're going to break it apart. So we're going to look at the first of each trait. So we have uh, big T, big R. That's what we put right here. Then we look at our outside. So again, we're taking that big T and we're going to multiply it by that little r. And that's how we're going to get that. Next, we're going to look at the insides, right? So we're going to look at our little t and our big R. That's how we get this. And then lastly, we're going to look at the last. So we're going to look at our little t and our little r, and that's how we get this. And because these are the exact same traits, we're going to plug in those exact traits on the other side of our square. So now that that's left is we need to multiply, right? Like we did before. So we'll start with green. So we have big T, little t, big R, little r. Big T, little t, little r, little r. Little t, little t, big R, little r. And then again, little t, little t, r, r, little r, little r. Next, we move on to the next one. We've got big t, little t, big r, big r. Big t, little t, big r, little r. Little t, little t, big r, big r. Little t, little t, big r, little r. And then moving on to the next. Big T, big T, big R, little r. Big T, big T, little r, little r. We've got big T, little t, big r, little r. And then we got big T, little t, little r, little r. Now we've got big T, big T, big r, big r. Big T, big T, Big R, little r. Big T, little t, big R, big R. And we have big T, little t, big R, little r. That is how we've broken down our traits, right? We've multiplied them. We know that if it's a dominant trait, the dominant trait goes first before the recessive trait. So now we need to figure out genotypes and phenotypes. So I gave myself a little bit of a break before we started breaking down genotypes and phenotypes. So let's take a look. 
So when we're looking at genotypes, we're looking at specifically what those traits look like, right? So we're going to add them up based on how many we have out of the 16 squares. So the easiest to begin with is obviously going to be our big T, big T, big R, little r. And if we take a look, we only have one of those. So we can say we have 1 16th big T, big T, big R, little r. Next, let's take a look at our big T, big T, big R, little r. And as we can see, if we're looking, we're going to have one here, and we also have one here. So we have two sixteenths of that particular trait. Now we're going to take a look at big T, big T, little r, little r. And we only have one of those. It's right here. Big T, big T, little r, little r. So we have one sixteenth. Next, taking a look at our big T, little t, big R, big R. We have two, so here's one. Oh, look at that, and there's two. So we have two sixteenths of that. So again, moving on, we're going to take a closer look at big T, little t, big R, little r. And we have four of these. These are a little bit more prominent, right? So I'm gonna change my color here. And we have big T, little r, big T, little t, big r, little r, big T, little t, big r, big r. It's kind of, it's, it's just kind of like crisscrossing through our thing here. So we have four sixteenths of these. Moving on to our big T, little t, little r, little r. We're gonna have two of those. We have one here, and we have one here. So we have two sixteenths of these. Then we have little t, little t, little, I'm sorry, big R, big R. And again, we have one of these right here. So we have one sixteenths of these. Next, we're going to take a closer look at T, little t, little t, big R, little r. We have two of those, right? So we have two sixteenths. And then lastly, we have little t, little t, little r, little r. And we've checked everything off except this one up here in the top corner. So we have one of 16 squares of those. So now that we know what our genotype uh, breakdown is gonna be, what is our phenotype gonna be? What is that nine to three to three to one ratio? So let me change my color here. Purple. So now as we're looking at this, we know that when we have a dominant gene, that means a big T, right? We are going to have tall flowers. And if we have a big R, we are going to have red flowers. So really the phenotypes we're gonna start looking at is tall and red. We can also have tall and yellow, meaning that we have um, uh, big T's, but we also have recessive little R's, right? That's what makes it yellow for the color. We have short and red. And we have short and yellow. Sorry, scooch over a little bit so you can see that. There we go. <laughs> so we begin by looking at our tall and our red. So as we know, we have to have a tall T and a tall R. So as here, we can see that here we have a tall T, tall R, tall T, tall R, tall T, tall R tall t, tall r, and that's it, right? Those are the four that we're gonna be looking at that fall within that particular category. So we have four, six, eight, and nine. So we are going to have nine flowers that are gonna both, uh, I'm sorry, they're all going to express either tall or being red, right? So now we need to look at tall and yellow. So as we know, it's gonna have to have a big T within the uh, 
the T traits in order for it to be tall, but in order for it to be yellow, both R's are gonna have to be small, right? They're all gonna have to be lowercase. So if we take a look, we have right here, let me just change my color, maybe that'll help express that. There we go. So we have a big T and then little R's, that's one. And then we have a big T and little r's, and that's two. So that's what gives us three. So we have three flowers that are gonna show tall and yellow. Next we have short and red. So as we know, in order for it to be considered short, both T's have to be lowercase, and with the color, one of the r's has to at least be dominant. It has to have that uppercase r. So changing my color so we can take a closer look. We have, we go, we have a little t with a big R, right? Little t, little t, big R. And we have again right here, little t, little t, and we got big R's. So that means we're going to have three flowers that are going to show the short and red phenotypes. And then lastly, we move on to the very last one, which is short and yellow. That means they both have recessive genes, and that's it, recessive traits. That's all. And as we know, as we can see up here at the top, changing my color, we only have one of those, right? We only have one. So we're gonna have one flower that is going to show short and yellow. That is how we break down our dihybrid cross, nine to three to three to one ratio. If you get anything outside of this, go back and double check your work, but you should always be able to see that nine to three to three to one when you're looking at your uh, dihybrid cross. So now that we have a better understanding of the two topics we just discussed, now we can talk about non-Mendelian inheritance. There are some exceptions to Mendel's law of inheritance. One example is this non-Mendelian inheritance, which is an incomplete dominance. With an incomplete dominance, the phenotype of the offspring will blend with the phenotypes of their parents. So for example, if we have a red flower that is uppercase R, uppercase R, crossed with a white flower, which is an uppercase W, uppercase W, there's no recessiveness. So how do we figure out what that phenotype is going to look like? Well, the offsprings are gonna be pink because they're gonna both inherit an allele from the parent. So they're gonna have an uppercase R and an uppercase W, and that means they're going to cross and create pink flowers, right? And another example of non-Mendelian inheritance, there's called co-dominance. In co-dominance, the phenotype of the offspring is a combination of the phenotypes of the parents. So for example, if you have a black chicken, uppercase B, lowercase B, and it's crossed with a white chicken, uppercase W, uppercase W, the offspring are going to be black and white, uppercase B, uppercase W, right? So we have where we have incomplete dominance where there's going to be a mixture, and then we have co-dominance where the two are just so dominant they're going to both express the phenotypes that are involved. There are some exceptions to Medellin's law of independent assortment. So for example, if there is a linkage, a linkage is when two genes are located close to each other on the same chromosome and are inherited together. So for example, we see this a lot with sex-linked inheritance. So sex-linked inheritance is when a gene is located on the X or Y chromosome. The most common example of this is colorblindness, which is caused by the gene that is located on the X chromosome. So just make sure you know the differences between your, um, your incomplete dominance, your codependence, as well as your linkage. And just in case you wanted it, I did another Punnett square because I know that you love them so much. So we talked about the chicken color, right? So we talked about black being BB. So we have a big B, big B. Let me just make it a little bit bigger so you can see it, big B, big B. Big B, big B. And then we have the father, which is uh, white, W, W, right? So if we combine these together, right? This is what we get. 
So we know that in this particular case, we are going to have a chicken that is both black and white because of the fact that these particular traits are co-dominant. I get it, that was a lot that you had to take in. So let's go back to stuff that's not as complicated. And we're gonna start by talking about macromolecules. So macromolecules are large molecules that are essential to the structure and function of cells. A polymer is a macromolecule that is made up of smaller units called covalent bond linked monomers. Chemical reactions can occur known as dehydration and hydrolysis. So with dehydration, synthesis is the formation of larger molecules from smaller reactants accompanied by the loss of a water molecule, right? Dehydration, we're losing water. Whereas with hydrolysis, this is the process of breaking down bonds to break down monitors, right? Again, we're having that uh, breakdown of water hydrolysis. There are four main types of macromolecules. We have carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Let's break each one of them down further so that we have a better understanding of our macromolecules. So now we're gonna take a closer look at carbohydrates. And these are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They're also known as the sugars and starches found with all living things. They're broken down into three categories. We have monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Monosaccharides are the simplest type of carbohydrates and they cannot be hydrolyzed to produce smaller units. A common monosaccharide is found in glucose. Next we have disaccharides, and these means that there's two monosaccharides that are joined together by covalent bonds. A very common disaccharide is sucrose, also known as table sugar. And then lastly we have polysaccharides, and that's that long chain of monosaccharides that are again formed with covalent bonds. A common polysaccharide is starch as well as cellulose. So we have carbohydrates that can take many different forms to perform many different functions. These forms are either linear, branched, or helix shaped. So when it comes to linear carbohydrates, these are those long unbranched chains of monosaccharides that form structures. So for example, cellulose is a major component of rigid cell walls that are found in plants. Branched carbohydrates are shorter chains of monosaccharides with branches. It's in the name, right? So for example, maltose is a common disaccharide found in germinating seeds that are used for energy storage. And then lastly, we have helix-shaped carbohydrates. These are those coiled chains of monosaccharides that form structures. So for example, we've talked about it before, DNA is the double helix-shaped nucleic acid. Next, we have lipids. Lipids are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and they are important for energy storage, structural, as well as hormone micromolecules. Lipids are formed by a linear arrangement of carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms called fatty acid chains. Lipids tend to be hydrophobic and nonpolar, meaning that they don't mix well with water. Lipids can be divided into four groups, fat and oils, waxes, phospholipids, and steroids. All of these groups are insoluble to water. A fat molecule is composed of a glycerol molecule and three fatty acid chains. Fats are used for long-term energy storage in the body. They are also useful in cushioning and insulating the human body. Waxes are composed of long chain of fatty acids that are linked to long chain alcohols. Waxes serve as a protective coating on the surface of plants. Phospholipids are composed of glycerol molecules, two fatty acid chains, and a phosphate group. Phospholipids are a major component of cell membranes. And then lastly are steroids. They're composed of four interconnected carbon rings. Steroids include cholesterol, which is a structural component of cell membranes. Their hormones like testosterone as well as estrogen are a few examples, and they are often used as chemical messengers. Next we have those good old fashioned proteins. Proteins again are composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sometimes sulfur. Proteins are made up of smaller units called amino acids and they are linked by peptide bonds. Proteins can be classified in four groups, enzymes, 
structural proteins, storage proteins, and transport proteins. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze biochemical reactions without being consumed by that reaction. They speed up reactions by either lowering the energy required to initiate the reaction through one of two ways. Exergonic, meaning they release energy, or endogenic, meaning that they require energy. Structural proteins provide support and structure. Storage, obviously they provide storage of nutrients. And then transport, they, these particular proteins transport molecules in the cell. And lastly, we have nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are composed of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Nucleic acids store and transmit genetic information. There's two different types that we discussed before. Deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA, and ribonucleic acid, known as RNA. So I'm going to move on to one of my personal favorite topics, and that is what you cannot see with the naked eye. Microorganisms in disease. Microorganisms or microbes are tiny living organisms that are too small to be seen with the naked eye and really require the use of a microscope in order to see them. Microorganisms can be found everywhere. They're in the air, soil, water, as well as found on plants and animals. Some microorganisms can actually cause diseases, while others help with the production of food and drugs or with the decomposition of organic matter. The human body is home to so many different types of microorganisms. You can find bacteria, viruses, protozoan, fungi, as well as animals out within the environment. Most microorganisms are harmless and actually very helpful. So for example, the bacteria that is found within our gut helps digest the food that we eat. Some microorganisms can actually cause diseases though. This happens when they enter the body and they begin to multiply. Once they enter, enter the body and begin to multiply, these microorganisms can produce toxins that make us sick. So we begin by looking at bacteria. Bacteria is a single-celled microorganism that can live in many different environments. Some bacteria causes diseases such as tuberculosis, meningitis, food poisoning, and so much more. Bacteria lacks a cell, uh, it lacks a nucleus, making them prokaryote in nature. Not all bacteria are pathogenic, as many are harmless and help with our body functions. Next, we have viruses. Viruses are even smaller than bacteria and can only be seen with an electron microscope. They are not considered to be alive because they cannot rep reproduce on their own. Viruses must infect a host cell in order to reproduce. So common viruses that you might see is influenza, COVID-19, measles, mumps, and HIV. And then we have protozoans. These are single-celled microorganisms that are found in water, soil, as well as the air. They feed on other cells and divide based on their mode of movement. They could be flagellar, ciliar, or amoeboid. Some protozoans cause diseases such as malaria, as well as amoebic dysentery. Next we have fungi. Fungi are microorganisms that are classified as eukaryotes, meaning that these cells have a nucleus. They can be found in air, soil, water, as well as on plants and animal bodies. Some fungi are helpful, such as those that help with the production of bread, cheese, and beer. Two of those are my favorite. I'll let you take a guess which ones they are. Other fungi can actually cause diseases such as athlete's foot and ringworm. And then lastly, we have animals. Animals such as parasitic worms are large enough to be seen by the naked eye and can live on the body. Flatworms can live in the intestines and roundworms can live in the GI and lymphatic systems. Not all diseases are infectious. Infectious diseases can be spread from one person to another such as bacteria, viruses, protozoa, and fungi. They are commonly known as communicable diseases. You're going to hear that a lot in healthcare. Some examples include chickenpox as well as the COVID-19 virus. Non-infectious diseases are not caused by microorganisms and cannot be spread from person to person. So those are diseases such as cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. 
So how do infectious diseases spread? So infectious diseases can spread through one of three ways, direct contact, indirect contact, and vectors. So direct contact is when an infectious agent comes into contact with the mucous membranes or broken skin of another person. This can happen through shaking hands and then not washing your hands and touching your mucous membranes. Maybe kissing somebody that has broken skin present, maybe on the inside of their mouth, or through sexual contact. Indirect contact is when an infectious agent comes into contact with an object or surface that another person then touches. So for example, this would be a person who has the flu touching the doorknob and then you coming behind them and touching that same doorknob. That would be indirect contact. This happens all the time with Clostridium difficile within the hospital settings. It is huge, huge when it comes to spreadability, but people don't wash their hands appropriately and come into contact with surfaces. And then lastly, we have vectors. These are living organisms that carry and transmit these infectious agents to humans as well as other animals. Common vectors that you'll see is mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas. And lastly, we have our microscopes. These are instruments that are used to enlarge objects that cannot be seen with the naked eye. There are two different kinds of microscopes, light and electron microscopes. Light microscopes are dependent on a light source, right? It's within the name. There are several types of light microscopes, including dark field, bright field, phase contrast, fluorescence, differential interference, contrast, and Con uh, confocal scanning laser microscopes. And then lastly, we have electron microscopes. They are dependent on an electron beam. Again, it is in the name. <laughs> they are used with seeing objects that need much higher magnification than light microscopes. They pretty much look at things 150,000 times the size of the specimen. There are two types of electron microscopes. We have transmission, TEM, and scanning, SEM. And that concludes the life and physical science portion of the ATITs. I hope that this video is helpful in understanding what you need to know to pass the questions on this particular portion. As always, if you have questions, make sure that you leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Head over to www.nursechung.com where there's abundance of resources to help you pass your ATITs. And as always, I will see you in the next video. <laughs> Bye.